I think what I'm going to talk about then is just the First Amendment experience. But everybody has said pretty much the thing about improv, and I'm glad we showed those clips so you can see how really, really good Doug is at improv. I mean, I don't know that he realized how good he was. I don't know if anybody else had that feeling, but I don't, you know, saying, oh, I'm not a great pianist. Yeah, you are. <laughs> you're not like everybody, every other pianist, but you're a, you're a great pianist because of what you can do with the piano. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not like you're going to play Tchaikovsky's concerto, but I, so what? I, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> not, not while I'm improvising. <laughs> and I kind of wonder if the situation called for it, if he couldn't have come up with Tchaikovsky's first piano concerto. It's very bombastic, if you are. So I go back. I think Doug started, it must have been around 1985. And, um, I never forget when I met him, we were near Bond Street, it was after the show, and some of us were milling around, and suddenly this gigantic person on a bicycle comes swooping in going, can you do it? I, I can't do the siren. And everybody's like, amazed. I didn't know him, everybody else knew him, so they knew it was Doug. And from that moment on, the thing I noticed about Doug is that um, every time you saw Doug, you knew things were going to be better. You knew you were going to be happier. I'm hearing this from the people at the bike shop. From, from everybody that he worked with, you knew that when Doug showed up, it was going to be okay. And something that Carl was talking about, when we do shows, these industrial shows, the second you got there, the second you hit the ground, Doug was figuring out everything about that place. The intensity of experience for Doug, that's why New York City is perfect for Doug. Everywhere you look, there's a layer and another layer and another layer and another layer of meaning. Doug saw them all. He ate them all. He loved every little bit of it. And that's why he's a great improviser, too. It's Now, for instance, in First Amendment, one of the characters that he would do um, was Dick Cabot. Remember when he would do Dick Cabot? Well, the thing about it, it's not just that the voice was pitch perfect. It's not just that he sounded and looked and talked like Dick Cabot. But one night it occurred to me, you have to be really smart to do Dick Cabot. <laughs> Dick Cabot knows a lot. I can't do Dick Cabot because I don't know what Dick Cabot knows. But Doug can take these characters and make them come alive. And you learn from them as though you were listening to Dick Cabot. You know, it was another side of Dick Cabot. Maybe Dick Cabot didn't even know. <laughs> <laughs> there it would be, and it would just come out. And I thought it was, I thought it was brilliant. I remember my English professor father visited from Missouri. He had very rarely seen me perform. And funny, I I'm very uncomfortable performing in front of the people that I grew up with. Um, parents, it just. Just gives me the willies. I can, my little girl is up there somewhere. I remember the only time she saw me do improv, I ended up having to kiss a girl, and she was, Dad, did you kiss that girl? <laughs> and I feel that way with my parents all the time. I do anything like that. But I'll never forget my dad after the show. And this was the First Amendment. This was Saturday night. It was 10.30 show, the hot show. With all the big shots, Mr. Gravenstein and Mr. Purse and Nancy Lombardo and, and Bill, and they were all performing. And my father goes, and, and Tom, there's Tom right in front of me. And my father, and me, and he didn't say anything about me, he was like, the tall fellow, I thought he was so smart. And so I really appreciated him. And I said, oh, well, I, yeah, I mean, he, he, he plays the piano for us, too, and suddenly it occurred to me, I was underestimating Doug. And I kind of think Doug let us do that by underestimating himself all the time. He, he was, here's a guy who, like this has been pointed out, any building in New York, he could tell you who the architect was and why it was special and what was important about it. And what was important about the building was what was important for, for Doug as well. Well, 
look, here we are. <laughs> I'm in California. I was going to tell about that story that we were doing an industrial, and Joe and Doug and I, Doug, of course, had rented a car, because Doug, he had to see everything, so he had to have a car. You know, we're in California. <laughs> so we got this car, it was about seated too comfortably, <laughs> and Doug, not at all, but we all, we crammed into it, and uh, didn't have power steering. What we did was we went to the end of the runway at LAX, opened the windows, got out of the car and sat on it, and talked about each plane as it came right in all of us. He was a big kid. I mean, we, you know, Joe and, and Doug and I, we just, I mean, we must have been there for an hour as the sun went down watching the planes come in. And how many adults do you know that you can do that with? <laughs> you can go out and just, just suck it all in and enjoy it. But I just want to say, the, day be the night before he died, I remember I was on the train and going over to the hospital. I came in from New Jersey. And um, every stop on the train, I thought about Doug. Everything I saw, I thought about Doug. That city, it's, it's so connected to Doug. Every moment, every step I took down the way, and then when I got up and saw Doug, and got to hold his hand for about 20 minutes, just hold his hand. And I was just filled with this feeling of, oh, I just, I, I thought, you know, if I ever underestimated you, Doug, or if I ever didn't tell you that I love you, and I never did, and we never do, do we? I just felt like suddenly saying, I'm so glad to see all of you here, because look at the people you're next to. Look at everybody around you. I know Doug. I know Doug is here. I know he is here. And I also know that we don't love each other enough. Not all the time like we should all the time. And maybe it's too much effort to love each other all the time. I don't know, but Doug taught me that when you have life, you take it in both hands and you hug it and it's, you make it part of you. I, that's what I just wanted to say about Doug is that let's all remember him and love him and honor him by loving Tina, as, as was said earlier, and, and by loving each other more every single day. Thank you.